All right, welcome everyone to our Science Of. This is our Science Of Nocturnal Animals today. So uh, like I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about animals that come out during the nighttime. This could be a lot of different animals. And we'll also talk about why animals do this and why um, they've kind of adapted to doing this. And then some of the really cool adaptations that night animals have that diurnal or daytime animals do not have. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, just so everyone knows, if you've joined us before, that's awesome. If you have any questions while we're going through the program today, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, just however, make sure that they're on topic and they're relevant to the discussion. Um, we will have some breaking points throughout the program today that we can stop and um, answer questions if there are any, but always we will have kind of a question and answer session towards the end, um, which like I mentioned, if, um, you have questions, please feel free to put them in there and we will get to them. All right, I also want to point out I am by no means an expert. So I love science. I do a lot of research for these programs and I learn a lot of stuff as well. Um, but I am by no means an expert in any of the science ofs that I have done. Um, so if you ask a question or if you have a comment that I don't know the answer to, I will find someone that does know the answer and I will do my best to get back to you. So. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into nocturnal animals. So um, we're going to go ahead and talk about the adaptations that they have and why animals are considered um, nocturn, uh, nocturnal. Um, and when I was writing nocturnality, um, any of you Harry Potter people out there, I just thought of like nocturne alley and it kept going through my head, but very different. All right, so nocturnal animals. If you've ever heard that phrase, oh, you're a night owl or um, anything like that, that kind of is where this started. Um, so one of the quintessential animals that we always think of that comes out at night are things like bats and owls. So um, the phrase night owl kind of comes to mind because most of the owls out there are awake during the nighttime and they are active during the nighttime. Um, so this is what we call a nocturnal behavior. So animals that usually are awake and active during during the nighttime um, instead of during the daytime. So this is pretty common in a lot of animals actually, um, birds, mammals, insects, fish. Um, it doesn't really matter what group of animals we're talking about. Um, if we go through them, uh, which we will today, um, talking about the different groups of animals and just a few species in each in Nebraska that are considered nocturnal. So um, why are animals nocturnal? It seems that it would be harder to see um, your prey, your food, it would just be harder to see in general, um, but a lot of animals like the nighttime, they like the dark. Um, so they do this for many reasons. Some of it might be to hunt. Um, and we'll go through these a little bit later, but they do this because either there's more prey available during the nighttime or themselves as a predator or a hunter can be more stealthy during the nighttime. Um, or they also might do this to find mates. Um, so one of the animals that I always think of because I'm a herpetology nerd, I think of um, things like frogs and amphibians. So they are out during the nighttime because they're little and they're calling for their mates, especially those males. They're doing their best to keep hidden during the nighttime. Um, it's a little bit more of a cover for them, but they're also doing their best to call for a female. So they're making a lot of noise, but at the same time, they're still being hidden by that darkness. Um, also, uh, even in Nebraska, we have to think about this. Animals do this to avoid the really harsh daytime heat and temperatures. So um, we think of a lot of uh, desert dwelling species um, that are coming out during the nighttime because it's a little bit cooler. Um, same thing for Nebraska. We don't have a true desert, but we have things like the sand hills. And even, you know, in Lincoln, it was 103 degrees like two weeks ago. So we have to think about animals. They're coming out during the nighttime to avoid that heat. And then also some animals can switch their behavior during certain seasons or certain periods of extreme whole, uh, cold or heat. So they might not technically be a full nocturnal animal, but they're being nocturnal and changing their behavior because it's um, adv advantageous for them. So just before we get going on anything, so nocturnal, we all know that word. That's why we're here today probably. These are animals that are active, like I mentioned, during the nighttime, and normally they sleep during the day. You also might hear the word 
diurnal. So this is kind of like what most people are. We are animals that are active during the day and most of the time we sleep during the night. Um, and then there's also something called crepuscular. So this is a little bit of both. These are animals that are very active during dawn and dusk. So things like a white-tailed deer is a really good example of this. So um, they're not quite nocturnal, they're not quite diurnal, they kind of fall within that happy medium. So, um, and also just to keep in mind, animals are never, it's never black and white. They're never just nocturnal or just diurnal. They can change their periods of behavior um, depending on the season. Um, or sometimes they're just animals that are like, I don't like the dark. Um, certain species and certain individuals of species. So it's never a, there's always exceptions is what I should say. All right. So we mentioned um, they're going to be finding mates, they're foraging, um, sometimes there's less predators outside. So why did animals decide to become nocturnal? Well, there's a lot of theories out there, um, but basically over time they have evolved because of many reasons. Mostly it's to evade those diurnal predators. So the larger animals that are coming out during the daytime usually are asleep and the smaller kind of usually preyed upon animals found that it was easier um, and less scary basically to come out during the nighttime. So they evolved over time. Um, the ancestors of our modern day mammals, they probably were starting to understand that they should come out during the nighttime. Um, so while they're active during the nighttime, Many of those predators are sleeping, which allowed those species to survive and then continue to pass on those genes um, and those um, schedules, basically, of being nocturnal um, to the animals that we have today. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons why animals are nocturnal. It's probably not just one or the other. And it's really hard to like pinpoint that because evolution is a very slow process. Um, so it's almost impossible to say, these are the pressures that cause all these modern day mammals or all these reptiles or birds to become nocturnal. But our theory is that it was because of mostly to evade predators. All right, so um, again, why are animals nocturnal? There's a lot of reasons. Mostly there's fewer predators out at night. Um, so a vast majority of nocturnal animals are birds, insect, and mammals. There are some reptiles, but there's a lot more birds, insects, and mammals. Um, so the leading theory, like I mentioned, is a um, long time ago um, when groups were starting to split apart from each other, when like the mammals and the birds started to expand as their groups, um, they did this because they wanted to avoid being eaten. Um, so that was one of the best ways for them to do that. Um, it's also easier to avoid detection at night. So many animals that come out during um, the daytime, they have really good eyesight, they have good hearing, um, so it's a bit easier to avoid that detection if it's dark outside. Um, darkness also helps the predators as well, though, um, so prey is easily um, able to hide or not be seen, but it also makes being a predator easier because you're being more stealthy. You have cover um, at night as well, so predators also capitalize on this time, um, so we also have to think about that. It's not just for the prey. Predators have an advan, um, advantage as well. Um, also, if anyone has ever heard of this, this photo here, it's called a grasshopper mouse. Uh, these guys are super cool. Um, they will actually howl at the moon right before they kill their prey. It's a little rodent. We have them in Nebraska, um, but they literally let out this loud whistle-like noise, and it's um, very similar to like a wolf. They like bow their head back and just howl at the moon. All right, and they are predators too. That's why uh, they're on there, so. All right, they're also, um, they're prey animals out at night. So if you're a predator um, who wants to eat like small mammals, there's a lot more prey out during the nighttime. So it's pretty good for you if you're out during the night, you can find more food. Um, predators in general are just more successful if they hunt while their prey is awake, which makes more sense. Um, and also mobile, because many predators um, at night want to match their prey schedule. If you're a large predator and you're hunting during a time when there's nothing out, that's not gonna be helpful for you. So you're gonna to have to match your own personal schedule to make sure that you're out during your prey time as well.
There's also less competition. So some nocturnal species um, basically do this to avoid conflict over some food sources. Um, that's one of the reasons we think bats are nocturnal is because they have such a niche of getting those insects, especially insectivorous insects, is because they want to grab those insects at night and they don't have to compete with all the other birds and all the other mammals out there. They've kind of filled that night niche. Also, nighttime's cooler. Many desert animals, um, even in Nebraska, they are out for a reason. Um, it helps them avoid the hottest part of the day. Um, so keeping wander conservation and not dehydrating um, during the day. Um, also moving around when it's dark and it's cool avoids overheating and wasting those precious water resources, especially if you're in places like a desert where it's already very scarce as it is. All right, so what are some nocturnal adaptations that some of these animals have that helps them be so successful during the nighttime? Um, well, vision is one. Um, so nocturnal animals tend to have larger and wider pupils. So if you see animals that have really big eyes, you can probably maybe think that they are out during the nighttime. Not always, but it's a good characteristic that a lot of nocturnal animals have. Um, so basically they have more rod, um, cells and cone cells, and their pupils are wider because they need to let in as much light as possible. Um, so this helps them see better in the dark. They also, a lot of animals have um, a reflective layer called the tapetum lucidum, um, which is basically behind your retina. And if you've ever been out at night and taken like a photo, you will notice some eye shine from some animals or that reflective shine. That is that layer um, that basically is mirroring that reflection and bouncing it back. Um, if you take a photo of a person and you notice they have red eyes, this is very different. We do not have that um, tapetum lucidum. We just don't have that, but nocturnal animals do. It's something totally different in our bodies. And then hearing. Um, nocturnal animals tend to have uh, way better hearing at night um, because they need to navigate sometimes in very, very low light. Um, so some animals will have cupped shaped ears that help them gather sound. Um, some animals like owls actually have what's called asymmetrical hearing. So instead of having two ears on the same side in the same space, owls have like one up here and one down here. So that's like surround sound. Um, they can pinpoint then exactly where their prey item is. All right, so a little bit more on this cool reflective layer that some animals have. Um, so basically it is right behind your, uh, right, I'm sorry, in front of your retina, if you're a nocturnal animal here, and it's a reflector system that is really helpful for vertebrate animals. So remember, vertebrate animals. Um, so normally the functions provide the light sensitive retinal cells. It's basically like a second opportunity for that photoreceptor. So um, it enhances visual sensitivity, very low light. And again, you get that eye shine. Um, so basically it acts like a mirror and it bounces back for like a second chance once that light hits it. Um, oh gosh. Okay. Um, so when the light enters the eye, it's supposed to hit a photoreceptor that transmits that information to the brain. But sometimes that light doesn't hit the photoreceptor. So that reflective layer gives it basically another chance and it helps them see better in the nighttime. All right. Some other nocturnal adaptations that animals have. Um, smell. So uh, usually nighttime animals have a better sense of smell because they will use scent marking. So that sense of smell comes from the Jacobson's organ, which is located in the mouth. If you are a snake person, you know that that's why snakes have two or forked tongues because they are grabbing even more sense because they don't have good vision and they don't have really a sense of smell per chance. They taste. Um, so when an animal, sometimes if you see them like opening their mouth and kind of like, um, I don't want to do it, but like, going like this, they're opening their mouth to increase that sensitivity of that Jacobson's organ. So it helps them even more um, get more information from what they're seeing. And then some animals have specialized hairs. Um, sometimes we call them whiskers. Um, so these are just sensory receptors um, that really help an animal find where they are at in the nighttime. Um, so mammals, the receptors, sometimes the whiskers or even just their hair covers their entire body. Um, spiders also have this. They use their webs as a sensory tool. So um, they don't see very well, but they can feel those vibrations and they will understand that if it's a food item, they'll go get it. And if it's not, 
not a food item, then they'll just ignore it. That's not going to waste their energy. All right. So there are some animals that have other specialized senses. So when we talk about this, I think of echolocation and bats. So bats, um, especially the ones in Nebraska, we have 13 species of bats and they all use some type of echolocation. So um, these are going to be your insectivorous bats. Um, this helps them find their food. So basically um, they will send out the sonar um, and then it bounces off of objects and it comes back to them. So if that returning sound has a high intensity, it means that that prey is rather large. If that returning sound comes back and it means that it's a high pitch, that it's really close. If it's a lower intensity or a lower pitch when it comes back, it means that something is smaller or that object is really far away. Um, and so they can fly in different areas to get closer to their prey. Um, if we think about it, not all bats use this because some bats eat fruit and fruit doesn't move, so they don't need to go find it. But insects are fluttering and they're moving all the time and it helps them pinpoint them with like extreme accuracy to get those insects. And then something that's also neat is something called bioluminescence. So some creatures will do this. It's very few, but some of them do. Um, if you know what a firefly is, they do this as well. Um, some animals will do this in the ocean. There's actually like plankton and zooplankton that if you disturb the water, it turns blue. Um, just like this picture here. Um, when we were in Jamaica, we were in this like tiny little pool and there was actually um, non-stinging jellyfish. And so if you went like this, the water would turn a bright blue and glow. It was very cool. But fireflies are a great example in Nebraska. They do this to communicate with each other. They do it to as a defense mechanism. They use it for um, finding mates and they also do it to find prey. All right, so some animals, like we mentioned, they're not truly nocturnal, but sometimes they shift to be nocturnal. Um, so the research has really shown lately that with climate change and the shifts in less water and less vegetation, that animals might be shifting more to a nocturnal lifestyle. Um, so research, like I mentioned, the daily activity patterns, we always thought were fixed. So if you were a nocturnal animal, you were always nocturnal. If you're a diurnal animal, you're always diurnal. We found that that's not true. Um, it just depends on the prey availability. It depends on how hot it is. It depends on the water availability. Um, there's a lot of like future climate scenarios that researchers have run um, and tested. And basically in areas now where the water demands are very high, that's where they're expected to see a shift in nocturnality um, more or the most. Um, so chances are basically limited to animals that are diurnal. They're going to restrict their activity to keep a positive water balance. So in areas, especially where there's low water now, we think there's even going to be less in the future. So they're going to shift to becoming nocturnal because otherwise they're not going to have water. Um, so shifting mostly mammals um, basically is going to help mitigate those water costs, um, especially in times of like the summer or extreme heats and droughts. All right, so how does this affect human activity? Um, so both nocturnal and diurnal animals have been somehow negatively affected by humans. Um, so humans were increasing, we're expanding um, the amount of utilities that we use, the amount of light that we have, the amount of land that we use. Um, and how one of the huge ways of doing that is something called light pollution and habitat destruction. We all I'm sure know what habitat destruction is, um, but really that light pollution is a huge problem. So light pollution is just simply man-made light. So street lights, porch lights, spotlights, um, the worst are like the used car dealerships at night. It's just so much light. Um, so this is actually a problem. It's called light pollution. Um, it's just that unnatural light in areas where animals are. Um, so nocturnal animals, they require darkness to be successful at night and it's getting less dark. Um, so they're being less successful. Um, so this basically, it is kind of messing up like the diurnal animals. They're thinking it's lighter for longer. So they're staying out more, which makes our um, nocturnal animals have a shorter amount of time to go hunt or forage or find mates. Um, also that destruction of habitat is increasing the amount of carnivorous predators who are also less afraid of humans. Um, 
So they're, or sometimes they're more afraid and they're changing their lifestyle and there's a huge imbalance. So you're seeing animals that are mostly um, diurnal. They don't want to be around people. So they'll shift to being nocturnal. Or if there's a lot of nocturnal animals, they'll shift to being diurnal. So it is really like upsetting the balance of which animals are out during which times. Um, and we're really starting to see problems with that now. All right, so that was just a very quick introduction to nocturnal animals and their adaptations. Um, let me check the chat here really quick. I don't think, okay, no questions so far. All right, so we're gonna go through some animals in Nebraska now that are considered nocturnal and just talking a little bit about their cool adaptations that they have. Uh, we're gonna start with mammals. And uh, again, by no means have I hit every single one. So if you think of some more, you probably you probably will. Um, I didn't get all of them, but I only have, you know, 45 minutes. So we're going to start with mammals. All right. So one of my favorite possums. So everyone probably has seen a possum. They are around quite frequently. Um, I love this photo because it's in a bird feeder and it's just sitting there. Um, so these animals are marsupials. They're the only marsupials that we have in North America, which just means that they carry their babies in a pouch, just very similar to a kangaroo or a um, koala or a wombat. Um, but they are considered to be nocturnal. So they have excellent, excellent night vision. And if you can see on this photo here, they have huge, really black eyes. So that allows that to let all that light in as possible um, so that they can see better during the nighttime. Um, they're really good. They do a majority of their foraging and they're hunting at night. So that's why they are out. They mostly avoid the daylight because they just don't have very good vision, um, mostly more at night. So they've changed to that nocturnal lifestyle but they probably come out at night to avoid predators. So they're not very fast. Um, they're actually very intelligent animals, um, but they're just, they're not very fast. They don't see well, they don't really have huge claws. They have some teeth, they have 50 teeth, but they're not sharp, you know, tiger teeth or anything like that. So there's too many predators out during the day. So these guys have kind of changed to their nocturnal lifestyle over time. Um, so it caused their eyes to gain that night vision. And then also animals thinking about this, Animals that are out at night, they are all limited to the same level of light that is provided, either the artificial light, the uh, man-made light, or even the, um, like the moon. Animals that are out during the daytime have certain characteristics that allow them to even see better during the day. Nocturnal animals are all in the same playing field. Um, so it doesn't mean there aren't exceptions. I know a lot of people have seen possums out during the daytime. Um, a lot of people have asked, are they sick? Are they rabid? Like, why are they out during the daytime? Some individuals just want to be out during the daytime. Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they have to move. Maybe something disturbed them. There's a lot of reasons. Um, it does not mean that that animal is sick or that animal is rabid. Um, one of the things you have to think about is looking for other signs of illness. If it's simply a possum wandering through your yard at 12 o'clock, it's not that weird. If they're, you know, staggering, if they're foaming, if they um, are attacking something else, then those are signs to look for. But it doesn't mean that something is necessarily wrong with that animal. All right, um, badgers are um, quite, you know, frequently seen, but also not frequently seen. Um, so we have the American badger in Nebraska. Um, most badgers, they are considered nocturnal, but again, there's always exceptions. This photo was taken during the middle of the day. Um, studies have found that in remote areas, badgers have actually become diurnal. So there's no one out during the day, so why not come out? Um, so they can occasionally be seen during the day. This is especially true of females that have young with them. So at night, it's more vulnerable. It's hard to see. She's having to worry about all the little ones. Um, so she will come out during the daytime when she can see better and then um, spend time with her babies at night. They're mostly solitary animals. They're also considered fossorial. So that means that they shelter below ground. They're not completely subterranean, meaning that they spend their entire life underground, but they do a lot, spend a lot of time in the dirt. Um, so they feed on things like gophers, ground squirrels, prairie dogs. Um, they basically will eat anything that crosses their path that they can catch, um, but they are perfectly adapted for digging. They have this like wedge shaped 
small head that is able to get them in between small spaces. Um, they have something called a nictitating membrane. So it's like a third eyelid that comes over so dirt doesn't get in their eyes. And they also have really long, sharp claws. So they're perfect predators, mostly nocturnal, but people do see them during the daytime as well. All right, so this is like one of the most quintessential animals that you think of when you think of the nighttime. So bats. Um, so the ones in Nebraska are 13 species in Nebraska. They use some type of echolocation because they are hunting those insects. Um, so that is like their main strategy um, and adaptation for being nocturnal. Um, so being nocturnal, it helps them hide from predators. Um, they sleep during the day, but they leave their shelters at night to go hunt. Um, bats also, it helps them be nocturnal because their wings absorb a lot of heat. So if they're out during the hottest part of the day, they're going to have a lot of water loss and get dehydrated. Um, so they are coming out during the nighttime and they filled that nighttime niche. Also, their food is out during the nighttime. Oftentimes you don't see moths or mosquitoes or a lot of those other animals out at night so or out during the daytime. So they have changed their schedule to be out during their prey time as well. Um, there are a lot of animals and bats that are nocturnal, but different species can handle different amounts of light. Um, but studies have shown that they prefer the darkness and they will even stick to the shadowy areas if it is um, light outside because they can get eaten by larger predators. All right, this one was super interesting to me because if you ever go to the Omaha Zoo, they have the beavers out in the nocturnal nighttime area and they are thriving in that time. However, if you go see a wild beaver, they have actually switched their behavior recently because um, at one point beavers were hunted so frequently, but for their pelts, they believe that they've switched to a nocturnal lifestyle so that they are less hunted um, because humans aren't usually out during the nighttime. So people always assume that beavers are nocturnal, uh, but they are also really active during the daytime too. Um, so it turns out beavers can see in the dark, but it's really bad. They are not made for the nighttime. Um, their vision is actually more suited for daytime hours, but studies have shown um, that they have kind of become afraid of people. There's larger predators out. So they've kind of switched their lifestyle to becoming um, nighttime. And people even think that this is like way back in the like Pleistocene era, um, that this happened because there were so many predators. And then as time went by, humans came around that they hunted these animals for their pelts. They've like, well, why would I be out during the daytime? I'm just gonna get hunted. So I'm gonna spend my time during the nighttime. Um, one thing that we found though, is that beavers, um, it's not optimal for them to be out during the nighttime, especially in the wild, because um, it's really hard for them to keep that internal temperature because they are in the water. So water cools down as it gets cooler outside, and it's really hard for them to keep all that energy. Um, but in remote areas, beavers are seen during the day. They've learned that humans are not around or predators aren't around, so they, it's safe for them to come out during the daytime. All right, these guys are super cute. We have them in Nebraska. We have one species of flying squirrel. It's called the Southern Flying Squirrel. It's located in the very southeastern part of the state. If we've ever been to Indian Cave State Park, you can see one there. Um, we just recently had some sightings in Lincoln as well on East Campus about a year ago. Um, but these animals are uh, literally adapted for the nighttime. So if you look at them, they have huge eyes, huge eyes. Um, again, lets all of that light come in. They also have really prominent whiskers for sensing and feeling during the nighttime. Um, they also have enlarged ears. So if you would compare like a flying squirrel and just a regular fox squirrel together, their ears are going to be very different. Um, fox squirrels have large ears, but nothing compared to a southern flying squirrel. So these guys are normally solitary or they're found in family groups. During the winter time, they will communally hibernate though together, um, about 10 to 20 animals we think because of warmth, um, but they don't actually fly. So being called a flying squirrel, they actually glide. Um, they use this extra skin. It's kind of seen right here. It's kind of like this flappy extra loose skin. This is called a patagium. Um, so when they glide, they will stick out their arms and this little extra loose skin allows them to glide through the air. Um, they can go about 50 yards if they need to. And they also eat a wide variety of foods, insects, berries, nuts. Um, they will also eat young mice and eggs and bark. So lots of different things. 
All right. A lot of people don't know that we have porcupines in Nebraska, but we do. We have the North American porcupine, looks like this, mostly found out in Western Nebraska. They have about 30,000 quills. Um, it is a myth that they can shoot their quills. They just erect them and they easily detach if a predator would like poke them or if they would get in touch with something. Um, but they do spend a majority of their time on the ground. These guys, they don't really have a lot of adaptations to being nocturnal simply because they have quills. Like that's their, ma their major adaptation. Nothing is going to mess with them. They don't have to have amazing eyesight. They don't have sharp teeth or claws. Um, basically it's just like, hey, I got quills, leave me alone. They're also um, really good tree climbers. They um, can swim also too, which is interesting. Quills actually help them float, um, but they are nocturnal and mostly solitary, um, but they can be seen out during wandering the day. That's not super weird. Um, best time to see them though is either really late at night in the evening or when it's early in the morning and they're just heading back to their, um, their nest or their home for the night. All right, so those were just a few of our mammals. There's a lot that I didn't touch on, like coyotes, red foxes, um, raccoons. There's a lot of those I didn't touch on, but I just did a few of them. There's a few things in the chat. Um, questioning hypothesis for beavers, changing to diurnal panels, beavers were trapped, not hunted. What would have been the pressure against diurnal activity in the first place? Um, so ever since the beavers are really slow, they don't have a lot of good adaptations to keep them from being eaten by a larger predator. Um, so I think what happened for them is that they've always been um, trapped. Um, people have hunted them, animals have hunted them, um, and they've just learned over time to not be out during the daytime. But in remote areas, they've done studies, remote areas show that there's not a lot of predators around, they will become diurnal. If there's areas where there's wolves, coyotes, um, other larger animals, they will tend to be more nocturnal lifestyle. So it just kind of depends on where they're located and what predators are around. All right, so um, nocturnal Nebraska animals, we're gonna be talking about birds now. There's not a ton um, in Nebraska, I focus on a few, um, but we will go ahead and talk to birds. All right, so just a few characteristics about our birds. Um, normally when you have a nocturnal bird, they have a very dull plumage. They're not brightly colored. Um, most nocturnal birds, they have like brown, gray, black, white, helps them blend in with the environment and at night. And usually nocturnal animals, um, the males and the females look very similar to each other. Um, something like cardinals, they're not nocturnal. There's also that um, difference in the male and the female. And they also have hem heavily camouflaged patterns. So they're modeled or spotted. They have the stripes on them. Um, this helps them um, be safe roosting during the day. So if you ever have seen an owl during the daytime, that's good for you because they're very hard to see during the daytime, especially like a barred owl or a great horned owl. Um, that's because when they're sleeping and they're resting, they don't want to be seen. And then when they're out during the nighttime, they also don't want to be seen um, because they have to hunt their prey. And usually they have larger eyes. So nocturnal birds, they often have like exceptionally large eyes. Like you can see in this photo here, owls, they cannot move their eyeballs um, simply because they're so big. Um, we as people, if you sit here, I can look to the left and look to the right. Um, owls cannot do that. So those oversized eyes, basically just let them collect and trap all that light coming from the outside so that they can see. And then some of them also have enhanced senses. So things like their hearing or their smell, not always for birds because there's not a lot of smell going on, um, but some animals do have that. And then also owls have this thing called a facial disc. It's not as prominent in a great horned owl. I will show you one that does have it, but basically their disc, their, um, facial feathers kind of cup together to let in that sound. All right, so owls in general are normally nocturnal. This is not all of them. We have burrowing owls in Nebraska, which are diurnal, um, but almost mostly all owls are awake during the nighttime um, or when the sun is going down. Some owls are restricted to hunting only at nighttime. So like the barn owl, the great horned owl, the barred owl as well, some animals, however, some owls, their specific prey, they have to be out during the daytime when they are out. So there are some owls that strictly hunt songbirds. 
there's not a lot of songbirds out during the nighttime, so they've had to switch their schedule to being diurnal. So again, there's always exceptions, but most owls, they have excellent vision, they have good hearing, they have a lot of eyes, they cannot move their eyeballs, they have those asymmetrical ear openings, so one's up here, one's down here. And they also have silent flight, most of them. So if they were spreading their wings out, and even if you look at an owl feather, it's serrated um, really slightly. So when they fly, it, they're silent. So if you had an owl in a room, you shut your eyes, you would not even hear that owl fly because it is so quiet. Um, many rodents and owl um, prey are active at night, so they have to be nocturnal. And then this is a good example. They have that facial disc, or if you ever see a picture of a barn owl, they have it as well. Um, right here, you can see their feathers are kind of making like a bowl on their face. That's letting that um, uh, sense of hearing come in and they can hear things better. All right, so we have the nightjar family. So the common nighthawk is one of them, not like a strikingly bright colored bird, but perfect for nighttime. Um, so in North America, there's about five different groups in the nightjar family. This includes things like whippoorwills, um, the common nighthawk, things like that. Um, so all of these nightjars are insect eating birds and they can catch bugs like midair or they use their wings to like scoop them in. Um, they start calling just right before it gets dark and they call all all the way into the night. Um, they also have that protective layer that you see here. It's like maybe a reddish color, reddish brown, gray, white, black, um, but it's very um, dull plumage colors because they blend in really well. And then we also have, they feed on invertebrates, things like moths, flies, beetles, again, things that are coming out during the nighttime. And they have a huge, very wide mouth. So when they're flying, they can just snatch them right out of the air. Um, most of these are considered nocturnal. But um, it depends on the time of day, um, if it's overcast or if there's a bright moon or a street light, they will hang around that because that's where the insects are. All right, these guys are super neat, cute little birds. Um, we have them in Nebraska and Game and Parks is actually doing some studies on them. Um, they're called woodcocks. Um, they are remarkably camouflaged. So if you look at this guy, he's easy to see in the photo, but if you're walking around looking in the leaf litter, you're not gonna see him. So they're very nocturnal. They're pretty inconspicuous. They keep a low profile. Um, the, the, in the springtime, the males will do these really cool dances. If you ever YouTube a woodcock dance, you will see them like head bobbing and there's like cool music that goes with it. Um, but they also have a really unique brain structure. Um, so it's cerebellum, which is the part that controls your muscle coordination and your balance is below the rest of the brain, just above the spinal cord. That's upside down compared to all the other types of birds. Um, so basically that's because their beak is so long and they have to probe into the ground, but their eyes also have to be visible because um, predators hunt them. So um, if you look also, they have big black eyes. So again, letting in as much light as possible and those dull plumage colors. So they are considered mostly a nocturnal species. All right, I think that was it for our birds. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about reptiles and then insects and we will be done. Is there anything in the chat? Um, owls with yellow eyes are more diurnal with brown eyes nocturnal. Not sure on that one because like for instance, great horned owls, they have those bright yellow eyes and they are strictly nocturnal. Um, so I'm not sure on that one, Neil. I would have to look into that more for you. All right, reptiles is gonna be quickly because not a lot of reptiles are considered nocturnal. Um, sometimes if you have pet turtles or if you're out at night, you will see turtles moving around, but normally they are considered a diurnal group of animals. So why are they considered that? Because they need something called UVB light. Um, so this helps process the calcium in their body and helps them develop those sturdy shells and sturdy bones. Um, and most of their body is made out of bones. It's made out of um, scoots and um, scales and they need that to make sure their body is healthy. So if they were nocturnal, they would deprive themselves of that UBV, and that's not what we want. Um, also, they don't have the best senses. Turtles don't have a great sense of hearing. They don't have a good sense of smell. Um, they're really vulnerable at night, um, so probably not the best nocturnal animals. However, if you have turtles as pets, you will maybe notice that they move around a lot at nighttime. 
wild turtles, um, basically what happens is if you see them out during the nighttime, they are just like humans. Once they get the good amount of sleep, they're like ready to go. So um, they basically are like, what do I do now? So they go around and look for food or they could just be hiding, but they are awake during the daytime, but they are considered a diurnal species. We have one pretty much nocturnal animal in Nebraska as far as a reptile, that is the Eastern glossy snake. So these guys kind of have that cool shine on them. They're only found in a couple counties, um, but these are fossorial animals. So spending a lot of time underground. If you notice their head is rather tiny compared to the rest of their body. Um, this is so that they can squeeze in and burrow and dig in the dirt. Um, so most of its life is spent below ground, but when it does appear, it's usually at nighttime. Um, mostly this is during the hot summer months um, and, you know, the warmer parts as well. Um, and when they do come out, it is well after sunset. So they are considered a nocturnal species, um, but they do feed on things like small rodents and lizards that they kill by constriction. All right, there's a lot of animals that are sometimes nocturnal. Reptiles are one of those that it just depends on the time of year and how hot it is. And I don't blame them. I don't wanna be out during the hottest part of the day in the hottest part of the summer. So they are gonna switch their activity um, as it gets really hot to come out at nighttime. And then when it starts getting cooler, they'll probably come out during the daytime and then it's time for them to hibernate again. So all of these different types of animals are sometimes nocturnal. Um, sometimes it's only during the summer months. Sometimes like the Western hog nose, they're more crepuscular. So coming out during that um, active at dawn and dusk time, um, some of them it's only during extreme heat. So it might be three or four days, it could be a week and they switch. It's just reptiles are so variable. Um, the photo here is a, um, a Graham's crayfish snake, which is the one that's mostly nocturnal, except during those really hot summer months. All right, so that was our um, reptile species. We're gonna go through and go ahead here because I only have a few invertebrates and then we will do a question session. So, all right, so I, there's a ton of insects that I could have done. I tried to pick some that are common that people see and also maybe some that aren't. So crickets are one of those. You only usually hear crickets chirping during the nighttime. Um, I know we've had a few in our Game of Parks building before and they're chirping during the daytime when we're all trying to work, um, but mostly they're active during the nighttime. During the day, they will spend uh, inside like cracks or under bark or leaf litter, um, but they do emerge at night and they're looking for food and they're looking for mates. That's why they make those noises um, to find a mate. So there are some types of crickets that have wings. Most of them though cannot fly. Um, they often get stuck inside our houses. They're completely harmless. They do get rather large. These black crickets that we see, they're the field crickets. They get rather large. They can sometimes if they're startled, jump about three feet into the air. Um, they're very, very um, fast reproducers. Um, so they're found pretty much anywhere in the United States. All right, moths, they are the butterflies of the nighttime. So um, these guys, not all moths are active during the night. A majority of them are. Um, mostly they are doing this to avoid predators, but they're also looking for food. So there are some moths that are really good pollinators and they only pollinate flowers that are um, blooming during the nighttime. So again, a huge reason why they have to be outside during the nighttime. Um, how do they find their way around? We think that they use the earth's magnetic field or they simply use light that reflects off the moon um, as a guide. If you've ever turned on your porch light, it's like right away. So that um, attraction to light, even though they're outside at nighttime is called positive photo taxes. So that means that they are simply um, really attracted to the light. And I tried to find like, why are they attracted to the light? There's a few theories, but no one's honestly exactly sure. Um, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of theories going on, um, but they're not sure positive, like this is the reason. Um, but they do have a good sense of smell. Um, so moths, uh, they use the pheromones, especially the females, um, and the males have to go find the females. So they have to smell her out. Um, so they have amazing sense of smell. And again, a lot of flowers, um, uh, are blooming during the nighttime. So they have to pollinate those flowers at night. One more. Oh, a couple more. Fireflies. So um, these are like, again, quintessential nighttime animals. They are not true flies. They're actually beetles. 
Um, one of my coworkers calls them lantern bugs, which I like. Um, most fireflies are winged. There are some in the same family that do not have wings. They're called glow worms. Um, but these are the ones that produce that bioluminescence. So it's a special light producing organ that's on the animal. It's underneath the abdomen. Um, so basically the insects will take in oxygen and the special cells will combine it with this substance called luciferin, and then it produces a light and it's not a heat producing light. So if you turn on a light, you touch a light bulb, more than likely it's gonna be warm. It's very little heat and the light is intermittent. So it comes on, it goes off, it flashes and in patterns. And every species of firefly has a special pattern that signals where to find its mate. So if I'm a southern lightning bug and I'm flashing this really fast, another one's gonna see me and be like, oh, you're my same species. Or this one's gonna flash at a slower speed. So every single one's like a thumbprint. Every single one is different depending on that species. All right, and spiders. This is hugely divided because some spiders are diurnal, some spiders are nocturnal, but the nocturnal ones are gonna be things like wolf spiders, black widows, brown recluses, orb weavers, um, and common house spider. So the photo that I have here is an extreme close-up of a wolf spider. That's what they look like when they're in their house. Um, and then uh, quintessential, like again, nighttime animals, the ones that make the huge webs, those orb weavers. So these guys are building or even repairing their webs night after night. So some species will tear them down and they'll even eat their silk so that they gain that back. Also because there's moisture on that silk and that's how they drink. Um, and then also, like we mentioned earlier, it's their sensory tool. So when an animal is caught in their web and they make a vibration, that spider runs out and be like, okay, I'm gonna wrap you up, I'm gonna eat you. Or if a leaf gets caught, they'll come out, oh, it's just a leaf, I'm gonna leave it. Um, some of them will actually remove it just because if you're an animal and you see something stuck in there, you're gonna avoid it and that's not what they want. Um, so spiders are actually very smart, um, but they are considered diurnal and nocturnal. It just depends on the species. All right, so um, this is it for today um, about nocturnal animals. I will tell you that next week is gonna be a little weird. We have a huge reptile event happening at Hardin Hall at 4.30, and I'm a little worried that I'm not gonna be able to set up in time. So what I'm gonna, and I will email everyone this, but what I'm gonna do instead of having it October 20th, I'm gonna move it to the very last one. So I don't wanna shortchange you guys. So instead of October 20th next week, there is no science of, I'm gonna move it to that next week in November would be the 17th. Um, and then we'll just continue on like normal. So we'll just go an extra week. So um, we're going to forego next week, but we still have things like season leaves, insect antenna, and catfish that are going to go on as scheduled. And then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, October is Nebraska Reptile Month. We have a lot of things going on. We have our K through 12 art contest that's still happening until Monday. Um, if they submit, they get some free swag, and then they also get a chance to win a good grand prize afterwards. Um, next week, we have a huge number of events. We have Nebraska Nature Nerd Night. We're talking all about Nebraska turtles. So we're um, having Dennis Ferraro, which is our UNL herpetologist, and a couple other people join us to talk about Nebraska turtles and answer questions that you guys have about them. And then uh, Wednesday, next Wednesday, we have a statewide trivia night. So October's reptile month. Reptiles, I, I understand, are not necessarily the most favorite animals of a lot of people. So we're going to give them some love. We have the ugly, unseen, and unloved um, animals. Um, so reptiles, snakes, bats, all those different types of things are going to fall in there. We're going to give them some love. We have five different um, trivia night locations, Lincoln, Omaha, Wayne, North Platte, and Scotts Bluff happening on the same day, the same time. Um, and they're free events to join. Um, there's more information on our website, and I will send it in an email as well. And then next Thursday, we have Nebraska Reptile Event. Huge reptile display is going to be happening at Hardin Hall. We have a bunch of family-friendly activities as well. It's a free event. There's free parking. Um, it's at 33rd and Holdridge and Lincoln on East Campus. And there's going to be a lot of cool stuff. And then October 21st is National Reptile Awareness Day. So great week next week to celebrate. 
All right, so if you want more, we have all of our Science Of recorded and put on our playlist under the Science Of YouTube playlist on our Game of Parts Education YouTube channel. And then we also have our Facebook page, an Instagram page, and then we also have Nebraska Wildlife Education website where we have free downloadable activities and more information too. All right, so like I mentioned next week, um, disregard this, we are going to put it after what I think the 17th is what it's going to be. Again, I will email everyone that registered and letting them know um, what's going on for next week. But with that, do we have any questions? Um, let's see here. Let's see. Um, pictures taken in light can be deceiving. I would think most of the yellow in the owl's eyes would disappear at night. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, considering also looking at like the barred owl, um, they have just black eyes all the time and they are also considered a really nighttime species. I, I'm not sure about the eyes. I would have to look at that depending on the color, but very good um, questions that you guys have. Um, someone talked about raccoon fatalities. Um, Currently the fatalities are the adult raccoons. Um, there is a large abundance of them, yes. So this is the time that animals are moving. Um, oftentimes with raccoons, they stay in family groups. And so when you see sometimes roadkill raccoon or raccoons that have been hit by cars, you will see like one and then one again and one again. That's usually a family that's traveling together. Um, and what's happening is that if one gets hit, the others will stay with it and then they get hit and then the other one tries to leave and then it gets hit. So it's like a domino effect. But um, yes, right now you are going to see a lot of animals moving. It's getting chillier out. This is also the time that deer are moving around as well. Um, so just um, very good to just kind of be um, cautious and just understanding of that as well. So, all right. Well, like I mentioned, next week is a little weird. Um, we will not have a science of. We're going to move it to the next um, following last November. Um, but again, I'll email everyone that was on today with some resources and some more information on how to register for some of these events. And we will see you in two weeks. So um, two weeks for, I think it's seeds and leaves. So awesome. Thanks, everyone. We will see you in a couple weeks. Thank you.